Our next guest is an Academy Award-winning documentary filmmaker, and his list of critically acclaimed projects include The Armstrong Lie, Mia Maxima Culpa, Client Number 9, The Rise and Fall of Elliot Spitzer, and Taxi to the Dark Side. And now he's turned his sights to the late, great Afrobeat pioneer, Fela Kuti. Alex Gibney, welcome to Arise 360. Great to be here. Thank you so much. Okay, so you've tackled everything from sex abuse in the Catholic Church to <laughs> doping and cycling to torture in Afghanistan. Why, Fela? Did you just need some levity in your life? Is Time that the for reason? some music. Yes, right. music. That's right. Okay. Time for some music. And his music is the greatest. I mean, he is really... He's a legend, and, and I think, you know, a lot of us know him now a little bit more because of the Broadway play mm -hmm. that, um, that, that was running on Broadway, I don't know, about, what, three years ago? Yes. And, uh, and so, as a result of that play, uh, I got involved in doing this documentary, which integrated the play and the making of the play with a history of his life and some material that had never been seen about him. So oh, let's take a look at a clip mm -hmm. and discuss further. Okay. okay. We don't know what happened. We didn't even know what, what offense Fela had made yet now because they just came, beating everybody up, and this is what they've been doing. Ah. I remember in 1981, I was arrested with him, and that was probably the worst beating he got. He was bleeding from his head, and he was in pain, and you could see he was in pain. And this was the first time I now realized, was this what he was going through all his life? Then you want to see the police beating. Yeah. Hmm. I'll show you police. Oh, the police beating. It's terrible. I'll show you. You must see it. Look at it. Hell. Wow. You know, I well, love... Well, I promised there was going to be music, and then it went <laughs> right to that. <laughs> right to There's the tons dark of music. The music is incredible. Mm. But had you known much about Fela before embarking upon this project? I didn't know that much about mm -hmm. his life. You know, I, I, I listened to his music, and I was a fan, but I wouldn't say I was an expert. Um, but it was one of the interesting things. When this project started, it was uh, brought to me by Steve Hendel, the guy who was behind the Broadway play. And he wanted me to make a film about the Broadway cast and crew going back to Africa and performing the um, play there in mm -hmm. Lagos. And I thought that was, an, that was an interesting film. But one of the things that happened was that Fela Kuti himself kind of took over. Mm. And he kept insinuating himself. And as we reached back for material, suddenly we thought, wow, that's pretty interesting, and that's pretty interesting. And then Fela became very much himself became very much a part of the film, and that's why we called it Finding Fella. Mm. Mm. And I love how you work in other interviews from people who knew him, I and mean, you interviewed everyone from Bill T. Jones to Quest Love, even Sir Paul McCartney, mm. he contributed to the film. So was it difficult to get them to contribute? I think it wasn't at the end of the day because they loved Fella so yeah. much. I mean, mm. Paul McCartney talks about how, you know, Fella had performed in Lagos at a place called The Shrine. Yes. Mm. And, and it was kind of this great place that everybody would come to and Fellow would kind of hold court, and he would play, but he would also, you know, kind of talk about the issues of the day. There'd yeah. be a back and forth with the audience. And it was all night long. Uh, and McCartney talked about he, he went there, and the music was just so fantastic and beautiful. He started to weep. You know, that, that, that a lot of people, when James Brown went over to Lagos, you know, all his band, Bootsy Collins and everybody, all went to the shrine en masse because they were paying homage to this guy. They, they, they just loved him. So getting those people involved was not so hard. One of the most compelling parts, I think, of the documentary is just how candid his children are with you. Was it easy to get them on board as well? Because they are notoriously private. They are private. Mm -hmm. I think they felt, and I think, you know, Steve and, and some of the other folks interceded and said, look, we're, we're you know, th this is going to be the one. So we, mm -hmm. we'd like you to come forward. And, and they were great. They were very open, um, you know, both about some of the challenges of being so the son or daughter of somebody so famous and who was so committed to a kind of a public life and would often ne neglect them sometimes as children, yet at the same time somebody who was so inspiring. And Femi Kuti <coughs> and uh, Sheyun both have, you know, very good musical careers of their own in which they found their own personal voices but also have found a way to extend the legacy of their dad. You don't shy away from the fact that he was a very complicated man. You know, on the one hand, he's fighting for human rights. On the other hand, he's a shameless misogynist with more than a dozen wives. Why was it important? 27. 27 wives, more than two dozen wives, right. my goodness. Why was it important for you to show this darker side of Fela? I think, you know, uh, to me, there was a, history professor I once had who always said embrace the contradictions and I think you know 
rather than see Fella as the kind of icon, it was important to me to see him as a human being. Mm -hmm. And he had a lot of failings that we have to recognize. The other thing was that, you know, here was a guy who was very sexually promiscuous, yes. and yet uh, he wasn't careful. He always had unprotected sex, and he ultimately died of AIDS. And so he put a lot of people in danger because he refused to see, even though his two brothers were ultimate, you know, were, were the people who were, the very people who were educating Africans about AIDS. So he was a complicated figure, and yet at the same time, he was such a powerful force in terms of fighting for human rights. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, people aren't perfect that way. You, there are great values that they have and then great deficits all at the same time. Yeah. What do you think his lasting legacy is? I think his lasting legacy was, he, he used to have a phrase called, music is the weapon. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and his lasting legacy is the idea of an artist, a musician, who can stand up for human rights and make great art at the same time as he's telling people, no, no, this is wrong, this is an abuse of power, and I'm using my art to make a difference. Mm -hmm. That's a kind of inspirational message, I think, for a lot of us today. Yeah. You're drawn to dark characters. Your I, last documentary. I am, I am. I, I, <laughs> We've got to talk about Lance Armstrong. Yes. You know, he's back in the news. He recently sat down with Esquire magazine. Mm. Doesn't seem like his life is going so well. He's drinking a lot of margaritas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But when, he, when you initially sat down with him, the story was supposed to be about his road to a comeback, it eventually morphed into him admitting to you that he lied to the world. Yeah. <laughs> and it, lied to you, well, boldly. Yeah, the film went from breaking away to breaking bad. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, a, it, was a, it was a difficult road. Mm -hmm. I mean, I wasn't naive about his doping past, but I think at some point along the way, you know, when you follow somebody that closely, inevitably you get drawn into them as people. And I, and I think I, I lost a lot of my objectivity and became part of the ride. And then when things began to turn, you know, we had an opportunity to reinvestigate the stuff that we had shot and realized actually we shot something different and more interesting than we even realized at the time. That's interesting. So even documentary filmmakers are not immune to being seduced by Nobody's these larger-than-life figures. Wow. Nobody's immune. Well, why do you think he let the lie grow so large? I mean, it just kept going on and on. That's one of the great mysteries, because I think that, uh, you know, there were a lot of other people who doped in cycling. Mm -hmm. But I think one of the things about Lance was he didn't just say, uh, you know, I played according to the rules, kept his head down and moved forward. He said, how dare you say that I, as a cancer survivor, would ever use <clears throat> performance-enhancing drugs? And in that way, he made cancer millions of cancer survivors and victims around the world complicit in that lie. And I think that's what people have a hard time forgiving. And I think in some way, you know, a funny thing happens to people when they... Uh, are telling a, a lie that big, right. they have to find a justification for it, a way of almost believing it themselves. So how did he justify it? I think he justified it by saying, well, look, I'm, I may be doping, but look at all the good I'm doing. I've raised mm -hmm. hundreds of millions of dollars for cancer survivors, and this is what people want, so I'm going to keep going. And, of course, it was very self-serving. I'm not saying it's, it's justified. I'm just saying that's the cycle logical process that often happens. Well, he called you to confess a few weeks before he made that stunning announcement to Oprah Winfrey. What was that conversation like? Were you angry, fascinated, intrigued, a little bit of all of the above? Let's just say that it wasn't a complete surprise. It mm -hmm. was a surprise that he called me. Mm -hmm. That was a surprise. But, you know, I'd, I'd started to see the worm turn. So the fact of the revelation wasn't a surprise. But, um, you know, it was a candid conversation, and I said I thought he owed it to me to sit down to me again and talk one more time, not only about how he had lied, but now to hopefully finally come clean. I still don't think Lance has come clean. I think that's part of the issue that a lot of people have with him still. What do you think well, he's hiding now? You know, th there's always bits and pieces. I think that, that the fact is that when you tell a lie that that's, that that's that big and you tell it for so long, it takes a long time to unravel it. And there are a lot of other cyclists who are part of this story, Tyler Hamilton and Floyd Landis, who also told big lies, and it took them years mm -hmm. to begin to unravel that process. So when you initially sat down with him and he was denying all the rumors, did you think to yourself, he's lying, I know he did it? Um, when I first sat down with him, when I was making the original film, mm -hmm. I had a pretty jaundiced view. I, I, I found it hard to believe that he couldn't have doped in the past. 
But in 2009, my brief was not to look into the past. My brief was to follow him that year. And he maintained adamantly that he was clean. Now, he still maintains that he was clean in 2009. I have a much harder time believing that now. Mm. Mm. All right. well, you know, after I watched that film, I <clears> thought <throat> to myself, if everyone's doping, then isn't it a level playing field? I don't think it's quite a level playing field. It's true that everyone's doping. You have to take that into consideration. Right. But I think one of the things that happens when, um, when you become, it was really Lance's story that was so powerful. So when you take a story that that's, that, that's that powerful, and is making that much money for sponsors mm -hmm. and for race organizers, suddenly people start to look the other way. Mm -hmm. When you have uh, somebody like Lance Armstrong, who's making so many people so much money, that's an advantage that nobody else had. Mm. Let's switch gears a little bit and talk about what initially drew you to the world of documentary filmmaking. Uh, it's stranger than fiction. I mean, I started out actually as a fiction film editor. Uh, I was working on regular movie movies, but there's something about the twists and turns of real life that's uh, intoxicating. I mean, I still love movie movies, uh, and I've produced some and, you know, may direct some, but I, I think there's something special about documentaries because there's a drama of the unexpected. That's and true. take Fela Kuti or Lance Armstrong, for example, you never know how it's going to turn out. Well, is it true you once considered acting? No. No. I mean, I, I was, so a, I, you know, I, I, was a, I was a high school I was a high school ham. I don't uh, think I was ever an actor. <laughs> Never took me serious. Ham. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about 2007 when your film Taxi to the Dark Side oh, yeah. won the Academy Award. What goes through your mind when your name is called? And did you have any idea that it would have that much of an impact? Um, look, it's always a shock mm -hmm. and a thrill. It's sort of a bolt of electricity goes through you. I'd been a little bit prepared. My film Enron, The Smartest Guys in the Room, yeah. had been nominated. And I had gotten the vibe, you know, it's a documentary Oscar, you know, I, I, somebody, uh, one of the photographers beckoned me, I thought it's time for my close up, and he said, would you please get out of the way, Jennifer Aniston is coming. Oh. So I got some sense, okay, I, I get where I fit into the, in, in the pecking order. That's humbling. But honestly, when you're standing up on that stage, and you know you're talking to, you know, millions of people all over the world, and they're counting down 45, 30, 15 seconds, uh, you know, I, I made sure to get the speech in so that I wouldn't uh, hear the music. Now the mm -hmm. critics loved it. What did the Bush administration make of the film? Not so much. Not so much, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, but it's interesting to me that actually, you know, it's a film about torture and actually the military has embraced it. It's now required viewing at the Army JAG School at West Point and I know a lot of the other military colleges show it uh, on a regular basis. Wow. Mm -hmm. Alright, so before you go, what's the next great project you're working on? I just finished a film uh, which I don't know, show maybe later this year, early next, called Mr. Dynamite about James Brown. Wow. A documentary which was executive produced by Mick Jagger, who's also produced this recent uh, film that's coming out on August 1st. Get on up. Get yeah, on get up. on up. With wow. Chadwick Boseman. That's right. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here. Can't Delighted. Can't wait to see pleasure. more of your work. <laughs> okay. You're incredible. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, you so thank much. You, thank this you. has been a real pleasure. All right. We'll be right back with more Rise Entertainment 360.